On this episode of Dead Last, uh, I thought we'd do another face-off, and it's one that makes sense to do, because we're putting the Terminator films up against the Robocop series. And, and, and these guys have faced off before in comic books and video games, but let's see how they compare cinematically. Uh, so this was pretty close to even since there's six Terminator movies and four Robos, leaving us with an even 10 to tally up. And here's the movies that we considered. And there's, there's some pretty solid contenders here for the top and for the bottom. And as usual, I sent this list out to my patrons and these guys answered the call. And they ranked them up with their favorite as number one and counted down to their least favorite in dead last. Where, wherever it was ranked, is how many points it gets. For instance, if you put a movie in fourth place, it gets four points. The movie with the least amount of points becomes the best, and the one with the highest points is the worst. Now, I got 43 rankings this time around, including mine, so that means that the best score that a movie could have, if everyone ranked the same one as first place, would be 43 points, and the worst possible score would be four 130 if everyone voted for the same one as dead last and and speaking of dead last let's get right down to it and see who took that spot this time around and just to let you know how i'm doing it since last month i started at number one and counted down to dead last i'm doing the reverse here well i'll be doing the countdown based upon where the drama is and this month the top of the list is way more exciting so we're starting with dead last and our winner here with 344 points we have the 2014 remake of robocop yes this got ranked dead last nine times oddly enough not the highest amount and the highest score it got was fourth place which it got one time and I had this one as my dead last as well I was one of the nine and it's it's just such a such a blank and sterile movie. I mean, when people talk about the original Robocop, the main thing to discuss is the satirical elements of the film. It, it's it's literally why it's remembered as more than just like a cheesy action film. And a great example to turn to when people complain that movies today are too political and that they didn't used to be that way. But here, there's no satire. And they tried to ground it in reality. But then the reality is just boring. The city doesn't really seem to be that crime ridden. There's not much need for a Robocop. So it just seems like they're doing it as a corporate initiative, which could be interesting, but then they don't do anything with it. And it, it takes them like until over an hour into the movie for him to even do any policing. And most of the action stuff before that is more military looking scenes than police kind of stuff. So for the majority of the film, it doesn't feel like Robocop which is partially, again, because the original did such a good job of making the city feel like a character. And in this one, you're barely sure what city it's even in. And one of the more frustrating elements is that it occasionally threatens to be a more interesting film and introduce concepts like a program that makes Robo think that he has free will, even though he's still following code, but then just doesn't do anything with it at all. It just brings them up and says, oh, Hey, how about, how about this? And then promptly forgets about them. And then there's Murphy himself. Part of what makes that character interesting is the question of his humanity and disconnecting him from his previous life. But here, he has his memory and his family. So that whole element is, is just lost. So it's like they took everything interesting from the original and discarded it. So I guess, you know, what, what was the point then? I mean, plus his look is just super bland. Basic black ninja look, whoa. And, and what's up with the hand? Who, who thought that was a good idea? I, I could see if they had some sort of justification for it in the script, like some plot necessity for it, but there's really not. So it's just that they decided to keep his hand for reasons. And you know, one of my least favorite things in modern, I, I guess, superhero movies, is that you have a character with a mask that covers their face, but your actor is famous. So like, you gotta get that mask off as much as possible, right? Gotta show that actor. But yeah, uh, this absolutely deserves the dead last spot. I wouldn't buy that for a dollar. Moving on to our number nine movie, and as pleased as I was to have the Robo remake in Dead Last is about how unhappy I am here because with 337 points, it's Robocop 3. It actually got dead last 13 times the most of any of the films, but did also get fourth place twice. 
And I actually had this one in sixth myself. And look, honestly, uh, there's, there's more here to like than I would have thought. Uh, I like the build up to giving us Robo. He doesn't show up until 20 minutes in. And, and I like that world building. Plus, that same 20 minutes gives us CCH Pounder, Steven Root, Jeff Garland, Lee Ehrenberg, the Human Flame, and Frankenhooker's James Lorenz, and then baby Bradley Whitfield, all in the first 20 minutes? Come on. And, and you know, people were bummed that Peter Weller wasn't back for this one, but I have to say that after his kind of wonky performance in part two, that really didn't matter too much to me. Uh, I, di I didn't care much for the replacement though. His performance is pretty flat, though to be fair, the script doesn't give him much to work with. And the, the problem here though is that it 100% drops any of the satirical aspects of the first one. It's a straightforward, typical action flick with a robot guy. Although I, I will say that I think it's the only one that emphasizes that street crime is often an outcome of desperation of poverty. The original film certain plays with the divide between street crime and corporate crime, but I like that this one actually humanizes it a bit and goes into it. Um, oh, yeah, and it has uh, the guy with the lollipop. That's prejudicial. Did the arresting officer ask to see their union cards? Yeah, yeah! The problem is that after the whole setup, it just becomes a kind of low stakes, kind of dull movie that just is never sure where it's going. And its biggest crime is that it gets boring. There's things that I like later on, like like I dig the Ninja Bot clones and, and I chuckle quite a bit at the jetpack soaring around. Those things are fun. But don't get me wrong, uh, even though I'm defending this one a bit, it's not very good. But there's enough fun in it for me to notch it up past some of these others that I was like snoring through. My friends call me Murphy. You call me Robocop. Next up, we go to our number eight movie, and it's our first entry from the other side. And with 324 points, it's Terminator Gen Isis. Uh, this one got seven dead last rankings, but did get a higher score here as one person did have it in second place. I didn't have it that high though, but I did have it higher than a ranking since I put it in seventh. And, and here's the thing, I'm actually on board with this one until they time travel to 2017. For like the first half hour of this film, I, I like where they were going. The stuff in 1984 is pretty good, what with the dual Arnies and the liquid metal Terminator there, and the obvious fan service of mixing in the familiar with the new. It, it just felt like they were throwing everything up against the wall and playing with the expectations and using time travel to their benefit and felt new. It wasn't just a replay of the various films that came before it. But as soon as they go forward, it just feels bleh. Uh, the, the more it goes on, the more it does feel like the ones from before. Just that basic, we have to get from point A to point B while the Terminator chases us. And look, I know that there's a lot of complaints of this film's treatment of John Connor, making him the primary villain, but I'll, I'll admit that that doesn't really bother me. I feel like in general, everything after part two downplays John's importance anyway. So having him be the villain doesn't bug me. But what does bug me is that he ends up coming off as generic as that villain and really feels no different than say the T-1000. Like there's some cool things that they could have done with that whole scenario, but then didn't bother. Um, it's pretty easy to see in the long run why they didn't stick with this because even with Arnold involved, it didn't really feel anything like the previous series, which doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Considering it can be thought of as like a soft reboot, it should feel kind of disconnected. But, but because part of it does feel like it wants to be like the others, it comes off as not really knowing how it wants to approach itself. I'll be back. What? Let's move on to our number seven entry here, and it had a fairly decent drop going down to 302 points, and it's another Terminator entry, Salvation. Uh, like Genesis, this was also ranked dead last seven times, but the highest score it got was one third place ranking. I wasn't that favorable to this one because uh, I had it all the way down in ninth place, and the problem here is that it just feels so different than what we're used to, which could be a good thing if it's not this boring. Setting a film during the war, the period that we really never got to spend a lot of time in before, but ultimately because of that, it ends up just feeling like a generic future war story. 
Like what made the Terminator films stand out was the time travel element. And then of course, the advanced tech. But when you set this film in an era that predates even the T-800, then it's just a movie about war with robots. And they don't really do much except, well, it's a future war with robots. Based on the original ending, it seemed like they were gonna go kind of bold and really disrupt things, but then chickened out since in the film we got, John Connor is really injured and needs a heart transplant from the advanced cyborg Marcus. But in the original concept, it was going to be more than that. Like the original ending had John dying and Marcus replicating his face to become John Connor. It, it would have put the entire storyline into a different context. And, I, and I'm not saying that that would have been better but it sure as hell would have been more interesting. And, and let's talk about Marcus. First of all, this is from the very short period of time in which Hollywood was like, hey, uh, Sam Worthington is a leading man you all like, right? Right? And, and he more or less just kind of sleepwalks through the role and just takes up a bunch of screen time from either Christian Bale or Bryce Dallas Howard, two people that perhaps this movie needed a bit more of. But also, setting this film in a period before the T-800s and then having this way more advanced model of cyborg than any that we've ever seen before it just feels off. Like, like they had this tech, but they were, I guess, just sitting on it. Um, and to, to cap it all off, there's no Arnold here. Like, sure, there's a fake Arnold at the ending, but as soon as you look at it, he realized that it's just a digital reproduction. It's not convincing at all and it seemed like they were aware of that since the first chance that they can get they're like oh uh well he, he gets set on fire and his face burns off so yeah i did not appreciate this one that much but you know a lot of you guys do seem to enjoy it more than me so i guess if, if, if you do oh good for you dropping down now to number six here and i'll confess this is one that i thought would place a little higher up here and it 278 points, it's Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. This got dead last three times, but did actually get one first place nod as well. Our first film on the list to do so. And here's what's up, I have this in fifth place, but I acknowledge that it's really not that great, but I definitely enjoy watching it more than the ones I ranked lower than it. And, and it's here on this list around the middle, and that's about right considering it's a middling kind of film. It doesn't really do much that the second film didn't already do. Like the, the TX is just the T-1000 again with a few mild alterations and the novelty of having a female villain. And I do appreciate that with the sheer exception of the silly boob inflation scene in the beginning, that the fact that she's a female form doesn't really do anything to the story at all. Uh, but it hits all the same notes. John's a troubled dude. T-800 shows up and gets clothes. TX shows up and starts the hunt. Good Terminator reveals itself and the chase begins. But the problem is that it feels like part two after smoking a joint. It's like way more mellow, man. Like all the action is milder and everything is just kind of relaxed as compared to the high octane in your face action of the second one. Like pretty much only the highway chase with the crane is the only memorable set piece here. But even though I think that this is fairly standard and not exactly exciting, I put it above the other entries for the ending. Just the fact that they were like, oh hey, this is a big blockbuster summer movie that's a follow up to a mega popular blockbuster film, but we're gonna have our ending be the good guys losing and a mass extinction event. That, that won me over a bit. That, that's a pretty daring way to end your movie, especially this type of movie, and, I, and I'll give it some credit for that. But I will also say that I probably would have bumped it up higher if they had kept in the deleted Sergeant Candy scene a sheer travesty of editing that I will never forgive. Hi, I'm Chief Master Sergeant William Candy. Ooh, it's me. Going down to number five, we've got another one that threw me off uh, because I was not expecting this one to do this well. And at 270 points, it's Terminator Dark Fate. Uh, this one got dead last four times, but its best score only managed to get a single third place vote. And quick aside, at this point, every single film on the ranking has had at least three dead last rankings. 
I had this one much lower than the consensus though, since I put this in eighth. And I'll confess that had I not watched this one in a binge, it's possible that I would have had it higher. But watching all of these one after the other, I, I, just, I just couldn't. Like there, there's two reasons why. The first is that when you watch these consecutively and then you get to this one, it just feels like you're watching the same exact movie. Again, it's the exact formula that parts one, two, three, and even to a degree, Genesis followed. And I just felt like it was spinning its wheels. And this one was a bomb. And I know that people want to blame the, this one on identity politics and blah, blah, blah. But the real deal here is that there's just nothing new to offer here. It's the same story again with very little surprises. Even our main villain is just a repeat of the TX again, except with the minor alteration of being able to separate its two forms, which is just not enough innovation, and it's not even really effectively used in the film. And that brings me to the second reason. I, I was a bit bitter with this because they went the Halloween route and decided to say that, well, uh, we're ignoring all these other films, and this is just a direct sequel to one and two, and none of the others happened. Which, first of all, is silly, because your series is about time travel. If you want to make it so the other films didn't happen, you can actually do it in the context of the film by, you know, time traveling. But the other point is that they, they, they did that. They were like, those other films don't exist. And then just did the exact same things that those other films did. They just said, oh, part three didn't happen, but our Terminator is basically the same as the one from that movie. Oh, Salvation didn't happen, but our lead is a sort of advanced cyborg tech on the side of the humans like Marcus from that one. Oh, Genesis didn't happen, but we're just gonna basically do the same exact thing of having an Arnold version of Arnold around just like that one did, with the same explanation, really? Like, what's the point of ignoring all those other films if you're just gonna repeat exactly what they did? And then you get Linda Hamilton back and basically just relegate her to standing around and grunting for the entirety of the film? Like, it's just so much wasted promise. And, and I'm sure if I only watched parts one, two, and this one and didn't see the rest, or just hadn't seen them in a while, this would seem fresher, but I did. So it just feels like the same old, same old. I'll be back. Moving on down to our number four here, and this is one I figured would be higher up, but I, I again, I, I have to admit, I thought it would do better than it did. And with 235 points, it's RoboCop 2. Opinions were pretty varied on this one, but it didn't get any dead last votes. The first movie on the list to do so. But it did get three ninth place rankings. And the best score that it got was third place, which it got three times. I'll also note really quickly that with the exception of one vote for T3, none of the films so far have gotten first place nods. And I had this one where it landed in fourth place. And, and I'll have to admit, my opinion on this varies like every time I see it. Uh, when it came out, I didn't really care for it at all. Then, much later on when I rewatched it, I thought it was better than I remembered. Later on again, when I watched it for a timeline video, I was excited to watch it because of that. But then I found it pretty disappointing. So I was curious to see how I felt about it this time around. And honestly, I guess it's okay. Um, it, its biggest problem is the disjointed script. It's trying to be two different movies and doesn't really succeed at either one of them. Like they needed to either have the Kane death happen earlier and establish a Robocop 2 storyline or just have the whole movie be Kane and have the ending set up the Robo 2 for the next movie. Like as it is, with that whole shift happening like 60% into it, it doesn't work. And also, they made the old man too much of a cackling supervillain here. In the first movie, he, he was a dick, sure, but he didn't seem overly malicious, just like a corporate stooge. But here he's gone full on evil. Uh, plus, they throw in that whole, they reprogrammed Robo to be a wimp, which lasts for about 10 minutes. And then like, like you cut out that whole segment of the film and nothing changes. There's no need for it to be in there. I do like the bit with his wife though. It was like the one little bit of Robocop's character development that seemed to work. 
And I, I also like that they attempted to retain the satirical elements of the first film, even if they weren't really successful with it. And, and what's weird is that this is by Irvin Kirshner. Like this is the man who gave us The Empire Strikes Back one of the finest sequels of all time. So it's not like he doesn't have experience with doing a follow-up to a top-notch sci-fi epic, but I guess just failed to grasp what made the original work. And it's possible that that whole social commentary element isn't in his wheelhouse. And weirdly, my, my personal biggest complaint with this one is the garish neon color of Robo that just seems like an odd color choice. <laughs> Thank you for not smoking. All right, this is where things get really interesting. The top three of this episode was such a heated race. Like the whole time, three movies just dominated and they were so close to each other. And all three of the movies had the top spot at one point or another. And there was one film that took the lead and stayed at number one for, for the most part of the time with only like a one or two point lead. But then, on the final day, the due date, that movie dropped down to number three. And this was one of the closest races yet. And in fact, when the final tally came in, we have a tie here. Both second and third movies got 93 points, but there can only be one winner here. So in case of a tie, we need a tiebreaker. And I, and I figured who better to handle this than the host of Shindig Radio himself, the creator of HalloweenShindig.com, Derek. Well, well, well. Seems like Dead Last has got itself another tie. And unfortunately, your friend Josh has entrusted that tiebreaker to me. And I couldn't be more pleased to do the honor because quite frankly, I'm appalled that this one wound up as a tie in the first place. So allow me to erase that mistake. When it comes to movies, the list of sequels that are better than their predecessor is a short one indeed. But I think most people will agree that Terminator 2 deserves to be counted among them. But I am not one of those people. That's right, Dead Lasters. Your number three movie is Terminator 2. Now, I'm not at liberty to tell you which movie I had to choose over T2, but I don't think it really matters, because only two movies should be duking it out for the top spot on this list anyway, and one of them ain't T2. Now, don't get me wrong, I love T2. It's one of the greatest action sci-fi movies ever made, and it's definitely one of the best sequels ever made. But it is still a sequel nonetheless. A sequel starring Edward Furlong in a reprogrammed Arnold Schwarzenegger's learning Spanish and shooting dudes in the kneecaps. And that's just not enough for this list. You want to come for the top spot? You better come with something original. Because the sequel, even this sequel, just ain't cutting it. So if you had your heart set on T2 making it into the top two, it's me. I'm the guy. I'm the guy that didn't make it happen. Now cut me off, Josh, before I start talking about the number two movie. That's all I wanted to do anyway. I just wanted to talk about the number two movie. I wanted to come on here and talk about how much I love it, because I love the number two movie. I want to talk about T2. I want to talk about... I can't say. Anyway. Talk about T2. So that puts our number three film as T2 Judgment Day with 93 points and once again was never ranked dead last and the lowest score that it got was fifth place which it got twice but it was ranked in first place 16 times. And like the ranking I also had this one in third place and honestly I just I can't imagine putting this as one or two because as fun as it is and as awesome as the action is. It is just so astoundingly cheesy. And that's not a that's not a bad thing. But compared to the first one, it's just such a jarring tone change that it feels extra cheesy. But 
like first, uh, I'll talk about what I don't like here and get that get that out of the way. I don't like that cheese. And I don't like that they ruined the perfect time loop example that the first film established, but I realize that that's more preference in my time travel films than anything else. Um, also, I kind of hate that the marketing ruined the whole Arnold is the good guy thing because when you watch the first portion of the film, you're really meant to think that Robert Patrick is the human good guy come to protect versus kill. And I can't imagine watching this film not knowing that and the surprise at the reveal that the guy you expected to be the villain is actually the hero. But according to James Cameron, that was his decision and not some marketing guy screwing over the filmmakers. Like Cameron said that he knew that having Arnold be the heroic lead would get more butts in seats, so he figured the ad campaign should reflect that. So it was his call, but it was the wrong one. Like the film would have been a huge hit either way, and the experience would have been better not knowing. But that being said, this movie's wild and fun. Like, like I said earlier, all of the action scenes are just pushed to 11. If T3 was action scenes after smoking a joint, these are actions on speed. All of the action is over the top and innovative, and each of them feels like something you've never seen before. And speaking of something you've never seen, I know that it's hard to think about this in a historical context, given how frequently we see CG creations, but damn, seeing that liquid Terminator attack for the first time was mind blowing. Like you just couldn't believe what you were seeing and they did such a good job integrating it into the scenes that it just felt more real. Even now, with all the advancements in the tech, for the most part, the shots still hold up, which is likely due to the T-1000 form being so rudimentary anyway that it just doesn't look off. And oh yeah, one other thing that made this impossible for me to rank higher, um, the acting of Edward Furlong. You say, no problemo. And if someone comes off to you with an attitude, you say, eat me. And if you want to shine them on, it's hasta la vista, baby. So if Derek chose that as our number three movie, what does that put in the number two spot? There's only two films left, the originators of both series, and they're both held in high regard. But which took the top spot, and which ended up needing a push from the tiebreaker to get second? Um, well, in number two then, with 93 points, and Derek's seal of approval is... Robocop! Um, of course, this didn't get any dead lasts, but it did get one eighth place spot, but was ranked in first 15 times. I, I should note that only three rankings in total didn't put this one in their top three, and only one didn't put it in the top four. And I had it in second as well, and I'm so glad that Derek chose it because it deserves to be here. It's an all-time classic film, a near-perfect movie. It's just a lean, mean story. It juggles so many hats. It's a sci-fi action film, but it's also a really biting political and social satire and actually does a good job with its characters. All of them, and it pulls it off. Even the minor characters feel like people, and the crazy part is that this film is only an hour and 45. It's not like this bloated two and a half hour thing just wasting time. It gets across the stuff it needs to in an efficient fashion. Like in that hour and 45, not only do you get to know and understand Murphy, but also Lewis, and then there's Sergeant Reed, and the old man and the, the villains. They're, they're all actual characters as well, from Dick Jones to Cl Clarence Boddicker to Leon Nash and, and Emile and Johnson and whatever you want to call Bob Morton. I, I guess you can call him villain or anti-hero or whatever you want. And you know, the best thing that Verhoeven does, what he excels at is making you scratch your head and say, is this guy the hero? I mean, like, like Starship Troopers, you have to question the society that these characters are living in and realize that Robocop is essentially like Judge Dredd, and he's basically also acting as judge, jury, and executioner while out on the street, using lethal force pretty much at all times, and frequently excessive force. Like, I mean, did he, did he really have to shoot that guy in the dick? But the ending also shows us that one of the side effects of having a police officer that is literally created by a corporation, you end up with a law force that is completely unable to exact those laws against the corporation. 
basically telling us that street crime will always be addressed, but that corporate and white collar crime will continue to be swept under the rug. And then do you wanna know what I'm talking about with being efficient? So there's this bit with his like finger port or whatever, and it's used as a gag. Like he's flipping the dude off. So, it, it, so it's just like, you know, they put that in there for a joke. But no, they did it. It's actually a setup for the freaking finale of the film. So it had a reason to be there outside of just like a momentary haha. -ha. And also, one of my favorite things about Robocop is that you say the name and people have this image in their head and it's silly and 80s and then you watch it and it's like the most violent thing you've ever seen. It puts most horror movies to shame. And on a final note, let's hear it for Kiva Rosenberg, unemployed person. Free society. Except there ain't nothing free, because there's no guarantees, you know? <laughs> You're on your own. <laughs> there's a lot of jungle. <laughs> that just leaves us with our one movie at number one. And like I said, it was a bitter struggle to get there. This movie was number two for a large portion of the time while the rankings come in and eventually fell to number three. But on the last day, jumped ahead and took that number one spot, but only by a mere four points. That's it, because with 89 points, it's the Terminator. This was never voted out of the top three, and the lowest score it got was third, which it got 14 times, and was ranked first 11 times. Oddly enough, the least amount of times of the top three films. But it was my number one, and let me tell you how agonizing of a decision that was. Um, I think that I actually like the first Terminator and the first Robocop an equal amount. Um, and they're both such fantastic movies, but what it comes down to for me is that The Terminator is about time travel, and I have a soft spot for that subject matter. So it took number one for me here, but let this be known. I think both films are equally awesome and all-time classics, but this film hits all the right chords for me in particular because I do like time travel movies and have a particular fondness for ones about closed loop time scenarios where there's one set timeline and any time travel would be unable to change things. And if a person traveled to the past, then they were always there. And that's the kind of film that The Terminator is. And it's a perfect example of that kind of story. Kyle was sent back in time to help prevent John from being killed, but that act of sending him back is what allowed John to exist in the first place. And that concept is just so tricky to get your head around, and this handles it perfectly. And it's a way darker film than I think people are expecting. I, I'd be willing to bet that a large number of people out there may have seen the second one before they saw this, considering how much bigger of a sensation that one was. And if you went from there to here, from, from Silly Cheese and Edward Furlong flipping his hair and Arnold trying to smile, and then you watch this relentlessly depressing and dark film, it's a bit of a shock. And what's more shocking is the budget. This was made for six million bucks. Compare that to other films from 1984, like, like Beverly Hills Cop, a silly comedy film with Eddie Murphy and no complex special effects, which cost 13 million, more than double this one. Or even Karate Kid, also 1984, a simple martial arts drama comedy film with no major stars and no action set pieces or robot effects. That cost eight million. So seeing what they were able to do here, with so little money, it's pretty amazing what they pulled off. And keep in mind, Arnold Schwarzenegger was not a known commodity at this point. He had some name clout due to Conan the Barbarian being a hit, but he was not a box office slam dunk yet. So having him in the film wasn't like, say, having Eddie Murphy in there. And Cameron originally wanted Lance Henriksen to play the bot, which also would have been interesting. And the studio actually wanted to put O.J. Simpson in the role. But Cameron was able to convince them that he didn't come across as a killer, something that Simpson himself was unable to do with uh, himself. And here's another tiny fun fact. In Cameron's original treatment for the film, he actually had two Terminators, and one was the liquid metal version. But he ultimately cut it out of it because he figured he wouldn't be able to pull it off with the money and technology available at the time. But yeah, 
I love this one. I love that it's number one here. Although I, I would have been just as happy with Robocop in this spot, to be honest. But this one is so great to me and deserves this spot. I'll be back. So there you have it, 10 movies and a whole bunch of robots of various degrees of goodness, uh, both in terms of their characters and of their film quality. But let's take a look at this ranking here and, uh, whew, boy, uh, this is probably the least I've agreed with a list in a, in a while. Like, I'm not like that flustered with where they are, but there's definitely things I disagree with. I mean, like, like I wouldn't have had Dark Fate that high nor would I have had Robocop 3 that low, but the rankings have spoken. Um, so now, down below there, I, I wanna know, what, where would you place these? But what's your number one and what's your dead last? Uh, do you agree with these or disagree? Uh, I'd like to hear that. Put it down below in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, click on that like button. Consider subscribing to the channel if you enjoy the channel and hit the bell to get notified when new videos come out. And go to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines. Because again, if you don't like how these rankings turn out, if you become a patron, even for a dollar a month, you get to participate in the rankings and you get to have your voice heard. And if you don't like how they're coming out, you can help change that for like a buck a month. Come on. You know you want to do it. Go to patreon.com slash movie timelines and become one of the dead last rankers. Or just keep on watching. I appreciate that as well. And we'll see you very shortly for another great video. Thanks a lot, guys. And bye-bye.